Hey, welcome back. This is part two of our two-part series on dams. We're calling this episode, Rushing Downriver. If you haven't already listened to part one, you might want to put this on pause while you go get caught up. So, prior to the dam removal, this was the, we would be in about 10 feet of water right here. And the, be the beach ended right there, so the former say, shoreline. This is something like four or 500 feet of sandbar sedimentation has come in right. the last so, six uh, years. Uh, well, have to do the metrics. The yeah. Um, yeah. bed raised by uh, three meters and then pushed off 100 meters. So it, the, the actual river mouth is 100 meters north of where it was, and then deposited this uh, delta of about 100 acres. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's interesting. It's, um, Look at this little protected nut. Yeah. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, okay, what's the best place? Best to have the mics in the nook and then... Oh my goodness, yes. Is that way better? This is a great spot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. So there are a few, there are like a fistful of lessons that have come from the Elwha and the two that I try to impart every time I talk to somebody about the project is um, these projects take a long time. They take a long time. They shouldn't. They're, yeah. It's not rocket science. This isn't, but they do. So, so you can't give up. You just can't. from Vancouver, British Columbia, on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. This is Future Ecologies, where your hosts, Adam Huggins and Mendel Skolsky, explore the future of human habitation on planet Earth through ecology, design, and sound. Before the break, you heard Adam and I getting introduced to the Pacific Northwest's newest beach. It's located at the mouth of the Elwha River, which is on the northern end of the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. The Elwha scenario is actually quite different from the Klamath. This whole battle took place inside of a national park, plus the near shore, with a very different set of stakeholders. It wasn't a case of farmers versus fishermen. In fact, in some ways, it may have been much simpler, but still, the dam removal wasn't settled practically until the walls came down. In this episode, we'll move from the uncertain future of the Klamath River to a watershed in the midst of recovery, examining what it took to reach dam removal and what happened afterwards. Our tour guides were Ann Schaefer, I'm Ann Schaefer. I'm the lead scientist and executive director of the Coastal Watershed Institute. And her husband, Dave Parks. I'm Dave Parks. I'm a geologist with the Washington Department of Natural Resources and a cooperator with the Coastal Watershed Institute. <laughs> the Elwha River was host to two dams, known as the Elwha and the Glines Canyon Dams. Both were built in the early 20th century in the hydroelectric craze which swept North America and they were demolished in 2012 and 2014 at the conclusion of a bitter, multi-decade fight for their removal. The Elwha Dam was constructed between 1910 and 1914, six years before the existence of the Federal Power Commission. So the Elwha Dam predated the requirement for an operating license. It didn't, however, predate the laws requiring fish passage. It just ignored them. and construction was shoddy. The dam was built on gravel, not bedrock. 
the lower section blew out after heavy rain in 1912. In case you don't already know, the Elwha watershed is the homeland of the Lower Elwha Klallam tribe, a sovereign nation recognized by the U.S. federal government. The 1912 failure of the Elwha Dam is known to the Klallam as the day the fish were in the trees. Several homes were destroyed in the flood. And despite this, the dam was a financial success. The owners of the Elwha Dam courted investors to build a second dam, further upriver. The Glines Canyon Dam was built by 1927. While the Elwha Dam put the Klallam under personal peril, the Glines Canyon Dam delivered spiritual violence, flooding the valley where it was said the creator pulled the Klallam from the earth. First, darkness. Then slowly, orange. There is only orange and the taste of salt, the taste of yearning. Your whole world is a sphere jostled gently by the current, but your waters are still. Your body is not still. You wiggle and stretch, testing your limits, pining to be free. Beyond your sphere, your eyes resolve the movements of others, your sisters, your brothers, thousands of siblings quietly growing in the cold water, in the gravel bed, biding their time. As early as the 1960s, the effect of the Elwha and Glines Canyon dams on salmon populations was already clear. As with the Klamath dams, the opportunity for any sort of change would come with a cycle of FERC relicensing. Remember, all dams need to be periodically relicensed by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, or FERC for short. As the relicensing date was coming up, there was this, un there was this coalition of people that came together in favor of making recommendations for the salmon to be returned. And so it was the Sierra Club, the Friends of the Earth, Seattle Audubon and Olympic Park Associates, which is an organization that's it's a citizen organization that's interested in preserving and helping the Olympic Park. Um, they collaborated together to intervene in the FERC relicensing. So it didn't just get to be a rubber stamp operation. These, this, these groups of activists and people had made a coalition and they, they intervened there. And so it sparked a big debate. And so it was through the through the 80s that, that as the relicensing process was happening, there was this big debate being built about whether or not the dams could be made reasonable for ecological health or if they should be taken out altogether. That's Ryan Hilperts. She's an instructor at the School of Environmental Studies at the University of Victoria and director of the Redfish School of Change. You may recall her voice from the top of part one, speaking about restorying landscapes as a way to build our relationships with the places around us. But more on that later. In the lead up to the demolition of the Elwha dams, Ryan researched the relationship between community engagement and the long-term success of large-scale ecological restoration projects. Generations had passed since the dams had been built. Locals on the Olympic Peninsula had grown up with the reservoirs and had fond memories of swimming and fishing on these young lakes. The electricity the dams provided had supported the regional industry through the 20th century, forestry especially. I did get the sense that, that there, there's a bit of a cultural shift happening on the Olympic Peninsula and people had lived there, who had lived there for generations had the, had the memories in their families of the park's annexation of a lot of private land. Um, and, you know, so, so aside from the whole Elwha project, the national park, you know, it wasn't always just a national park. People lived there, and as the national park's boundaries sort of expanded over the years, they would, um, they bought a bunch of inholdings in the park, and people have opinions about that, you know? And so I think there's a bit of that, there's a thread of that that was a part of what people felt in opposition. And then also, you know, in the 90s, logging on the peninsula 
was a really important industry. And then through the 90s, there was this whole thing that happened with the spotted owl in the forest there. It's on the endangered species list and it created the, the creation of the Northwest Forest Plan and really severely impacted the logging industry on the peninsula. And there's a perception there, I think a pretty accurate perception, that those changes came about from federal agencies and um, organizations of people, environmental organizations, people who don't actually live on the Olympic Peninsula, who live in Seattle, live in Washington, D.C., and organize for conservation purposes. And I think people on the peninsula in the 90s and into the 2000s still felt that they were in the crosshairs of, of that struggle over what can be done on the land. Tensions over the removal of the dams eventually grew into a national, partisan battle. Many people of Port Angeles felt threatened by the changes called for by environmentalists. They appeared as outsiders, happy to cast opinions about a cloudy coast they may never have visited. Homesteads and lands had once been annexed and absorbed into Olympic National Park, and the memory of that loss had not yet faded. And people live on the peninsula because they love the place and they love the land and they love the forest and they engage with the land, you know. You know, and then the park is a park is a magnet for people from all these other places to come, and it's managed by people from other places. And people who work for the park, um, some of them stay there for their whole careers, but a lot of you know the parkies in Port Angeles come in seasonally and and leave. So there's a bit of a I don't want to overcharacterize that divide, but but there is a bit of a divide there that I think um, breeds a bit of a suspicion or resentment is kind of a strong word, but um, just a protectiveness of autonomy that's challenged by, by having a big federal agency control like a majority of the land that's near where you live. Weeks have passed. The yolk is gone. Your egg dissolved. The light of the shallows beckons. You and your fellow fry have developed a taste for insects humming at the water's surface. Life is easy and playful. The water is sweet and fresh. After only days, a few impatient siblings head downriver into the unknown. You will stay for a few months. Some may linger for several years. But after decades of debate, the National Park Service finally came out in favor of dam removal in the early 1990s. Some of the arguments that were really effectively made were that the, you know, the cost of bringing it up to code essentially um, out, you know, outweighed any of the benefits of having the dams in place. They weren't, by that point, they weren't producing very much electricity for the North Olympic Peninsula. They had originally been built to help kind of prop up this timber industry um, and they were they were supplying electricity to mills and things like that and at this by this point in history um, that power was coming from someplace else and there wasn't as much as much need for them so there's there were pragmatic reasons that that it didn't make sense to to upgrade the dams then in 1992 President George H.W. Bush signed the Elwha River Ecosystem and Fisheries Restoration Act with that came federal authorization to identify a path to full restoration of the river. Rivers are the link between land and sea. No ecosystem could ever be considered simple, but rivers present uniquely challenging restoration projects. Rivers pass sediment, wood, and nutrients downstream, dropping debris along their banks, home to staggering biodiversity. And some nutrients return to the land, in the form of salmon and other anadromous fish migrating up the river to spawn and die.
You and your fellow fry learn quickly in the clear, cold, sweet waters of your home. For now, you look more like a tiny glimmer of silver than the king salmon you will become. To survive until then, you must be fast. The gulls will not reach you behind boulders. The mouths of hungry bass and sculpins can't chase you under branches, gifts of safety from upriver. Floods threaten to wash you away before your time, but you find refuge in the many side channels. Life is dangerous, but the river provides. At the northern edge of the Olympic Peninsula, just across the Strait of Juan de Fuca from Vancouver Island, Port Angeles is 15 minutes from the Elwha River. Living and working in Port Angeles since the early 1990s, Ann Schaefer and Dave Parks have been studying the Elwha Nearshore, where the river meets the ocean. The first time I heard about the dam removal project, we were living in Seattle, and um, I think I'd, I don't even remember who I'd heard it f- about it from, but I was interested in doing a study looking at the estuary prior to the dam removal happening. This was, this was prior to the actual uh, enabling legislation, which was in 1992. And um, one of my first recollections of the project was arguing with the project manager, Brian Winter, at the National Park, um, who and I'll never forget it, stated, quote unquote, that the near shore was not a part of the project. And so from that day forward, it was a very keen focus of mine as a marine biologist um, to to really get a handle and some vision on the near shore aspect of the dam removal project. Biodiversity flourishes at boundaries, where different environments blur together. The near shore is no exception. And the nearshore system is such a critical component to all the species that are at the heart of the ecosystem restoration project. The nearshore is a place for young anadromous fish to adapt from river life to the open ocean. It's host to incredible numbers of algae, invertebrates, and plants. And it's the foundation of the food web for many birds. The jurisdiction for dam removal had been defined by the borders of the Olympic National Park which does not include the river mouth and the near shore. Despite that, Anne knew that categorically ignoring the estuary would be a glaring omission in the project and a huge missed opportunity for research. There were elements to it that nobody was looking at. One of the yeah. most uh, basic of questions of what is the relative contribution of the river and the bluffs to the sediment uh, dynamics of the littoral system, and nobody could answer that, which is shocking when you think about the scale of the project and that was going to unfold. And you know, the important thing to remember with the Elwha project is it's a sediment project. And um, so when you release two dams, you do restore the fish passage aspect, but that's not the critical ecosystem component to it. It's the relinking of the hydrodynamic processes, and that translates to the near shore as well. And when you say, you say literal, you're, you're not meaning literally. <laughs> the littoral l- 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 system. Littoral, yeah. L-I-T-T-O-R-A-L. <laughs> The littoral system essentially means the shoreline. It includes the waters of the intertidal and the shallow edge of the ocean. One night, Restless, you feel a call for change. Tail first, by moonlight, you let the current carry you. You wind downriver, past eddies, over riffles, rapids, and falls. You notice a new taste. No, an old taste. The first taste, salt. You've reached the estuary, where sweet water meets the sea. You'll rest here a while, learn to eat crustaceans, and grow. Um, 
So many of the species that are central to the nearshore ecosystem restoration project have life history phases that are literally dependent on uh, the nearshore. So the juvenile salmon that are out migrating from the river use the nearshore to rear, to feed, to rest, and to transition into their marine and offshore phases. There are smelt species that are anadromous that will migrate along the shoreline and then come up the river to spawn. There are uh, lamprey species that are very critical to the ecosystem of the watershed. And then there are also smelt species that will use the shoreline for migration and spawning. They actually spawn on intertidal beaches as do sand lance, and those are collectively called forage fish. And forage fish are the basis for, again, our coastal systems, everything from, um, you know, salmon to killer whales depend on them. So, and without the nearshore, we don't have those species. We just don't have them. The nearshore, the estuary, is built out of sediment, erosion in the watershed which ends up at the river mouth as silt and sand. The amount of sediment at the nearshore is in equilibrium. It's replenished by the river and washed away by the tides. When a dam is built, this balance is lost. Sediment accumulates behind the dam, and the beautiful, complex nearshore ebbs away. It's a key component to the ecosystem. It's its own zone in the ecosystem, and without it, the rest of the watershed doesn't function. Of course, to understand the estuary and the pressures put upon it by the dam, It takes significant resources, time, personnel, and of course, funding. Ann and Dave made a personal commitment to study the near shore, and the Clallam were doing the same. But as long as funding remained uncertain, no university would spare a grad student. There was no institutional support to study the Elwha near shore. Uh, Enabling legislation was enacted in 1992. That legislation was actually the um, resolution of a lawsuit by the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe against the Olympic National Park for violating their treaty trust responsibility. The dam removal legislation was the settlement of that lawsuit. So that was enacted in 1992. um, And then it took 25 years of planning and political, you know, shenanigans and it was a long long process it took 13 appropriations Um, and for those of us that worked on the project over its entirety we never knew if or when the project was actually going to happen then in 2009 the obama administration issued an economic stimulus package which included 54 million dollars for the olympic national park much of which was earmarked for the dam removals From there, the race was on to collect as much baseline data as possible. But as soon as the the final pieces of funding dropped into place, everybody was out here. So a lot of the data sets start about two years before the dam removal. And there we started getting a lot of the nearshore data. So then you start seeing some of these other richer data sets. Um, And so that was really what did it. It It was that last gap in the funding, when that dropped into place, bam, everybody was out here. Most of what we know about the state of the river prior to dam removal comes from only 18 months of data between the stimulus package and the start of demolition. Finally, almost exactly a century after they were built, the Elwha and Glines Canyon dams were carefully broken apart. Once again, the Elwha River flowed free and 100 years of sediment was released. And I have to say, ever since that project, every time I hear a jackhammer, I just, it just warms my heart, you know, which I've never had that attitude before, so. You make your rounds through the shallows and sandbanks, patterns that shift, but always repeat. You notice some krill in the shallows, but they're not worth your while. A shimmer catches your eye, a school of smelt. You flank them, deftly, into a corner, and snatch one to make your meal. It dawns on you that you no longer fit as easily into the side channels, under the branches, or behind the boulders. It hardly matters. Predators rarely bother you these days. You've grown, and your power has grown with you. 
Your estuary, once so large and labyrinthine, has softened in its mystery. Your next move is upon you, and you venture out into the depths. And just as soon as the dam came down, the fish were back. As soon as, as soon as you pull the dam out, those the fish are in there. Mm-hmm. Just how fast right. these right. habitats right. Um, become used. They they make use of the available habitat very quickly. Some within literally within hours. We've seen a transition, um, and almost immediately we saw this whole new. Suite. It was like Christmas. Animals that had never been seen before in the near shore were suddenly being documented. Fish like ulican, redside shiner, and lamprey. Now the sense is my intuition just from working out here for so long and the data are starting to show it, things seem to be stabilizing. But the story of a river renewal is almost as nuanced as the river itself. But the other feature that um, dominates, and this is what we've seen from our sampling, that dominates the system are the hatcheries. We have two hatcheries that operate in the Lower Elwha. One's operated by the Lower Elwha Clallam tribe, and they release coho and steelhead. And then the other is the uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife hatchery, and they release upwards of two million. And the return of the near shore has created habitat for more than just fish and shorebirds. The Pacific Northwest's newest beach has become a quick hit with the local human population. As this delta evolves and grows. It's grown by just about 80 acres. Um, It's become very popular for people and it's basically become a dog park. And so now we're having this intersection between the uh, evolving and restoring ecosystem and human. Canines. (laughs) And people that own them. It's all too easy to think of ecosystem restoration as a time machine, a way to turn back the clock and undo the damage we've sown in our industrial age. But that's not how dynamic systems work. The conditions are different now, and change begets change. The, the thing that we really have to now, again, we're having to manage for is because this has become such a destination, now, like I say, immediately what's happening is people are challenging it again. So in ways that I don't think they would have otherwise because there is such a nice beach here and it, you know, it does have the cachet, the Elwha cachet. So now we are seeing, you know, extra development, extra, you know, increase in real estate rates. You know. The nearshore provides all sorts of ecosystem services, some of which have direct impacts to human capital. A healthy nearshore comes with flood protection and shore breaks, making coastal development that much more appealing. Out at sea, the world is deep and boundless. Your juvenile years are a distant memory. You've traveled, seen wonders, monsters, and sights beyond imagination. You rise towards the waves and feel a small tug inside of you, a magnet in your mind. Your blood pulses with new hormones, and you can feel them rebuilding your body one cell at a time. You recall a faraway taste. You're going home. In as much as ecosystem restoration is a human project, the measure of its success lives in the minds of people, especially those who call that land home. This kind of success is not based on data points and checklists and mandates. It's sustained by the stories we tell, our personal connection to our world. Ryan Hilperts explains. As we build relationships with each other through story, we build relationship with place through story. And you know, the places where people are building stories and building relationship with place, I think is 
is sort of like the connective tissue of, of what the potential of focal restoration can be, you know, in that, in that we build a web and a, and a reciprocity with land when we, and water, when we, when we know it in the way that it's the character in our stories and we're a character in its story. Realistically, major projects such as dam removals require huge budgets, planning, and clear definitions. These projects can only be taken on by government-scale entities. Their approach to restoration is necessarily bureaucratic and technological, and it seems like the only way to marshal the people and the resources required. That's not to say that people who work professionally in restoration don't have stories with place. You know, but if we but if we conceive of restoration in a way that excludes people who aren't engaged with it professionally, then we then we lose this opportunity to build all that that web of support for our place and for our communities too. So focal community engagement means talking about the land, making art about the land, and above all, getting as many people as possible to have experiences with the land. Partnerships with unlikely partners, I think, is important. So partnerships with elementary schools and environmental education programs and math classes and, um, you know, uh, organizations for new immigrants, like refugee support agencies. I mean, thinking outside of the box of just your, um, your conservation groups to, to think about who who cares for this place now and who will care for this place? Like, you know, finding ways to have all the different kinds of knowledge and all the different kinds of wisdom and all the different kinds of stories be a part of, of how decisions get made about restoration is probably what we should be aiming for, you know, because diversity is better. Yeah, and it's, you can't, it's like you can't really put that on a checklist for restoration. So, with so much uncertainty, what's the story with the Klamath now? Well, the dams are still there, and salmon populations have reached historic lows in recent years. But even though the Klamath Basin Restoration Agreement fell apart after Congress blocked it, it looks like the dams might still come out. Ironically though, some of the concessions and measures to protect farmers and irrigation districts that were a big part of that deal they died with it in Congress. And without those measures, many of the constituents of the representatives that torpedoed the deal are going to suffer. You might say that ideology trumped self-interest in this case. It is a really interesting political phenomenon and it hasn't completely played itself out, right? Like some of those guys are still in office, but there was a lot of frustration on the part of these federal irrigation districts that were trying really hard to bridge this gulf between communities and you know, here all these people overcame their differences and went to Congress people and said, here, we did it for you. And even though Congress passed, there was still so much momentum for dam removal that the primary stakeholders sat down again to figure out how to at least take the dams out, which resulted in the Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement. So now there's an amended Klamath Hydroelectric Settlement Agreement, which is the KHSA you were talking about. And basically what happened, you know, there was a lot of campaigning and political pressure put on Pacificor that owns the dams. To the point where Pacificor eventually said, this is not worth the bad press, we'll take dams out. So what we did as a mechanism, you know, the legislation failed in Congress, so who's gonna actually do the work? Who's gonna take the dams out? It's not gonna be the feds. It's not gonna be tribes. So who is it gonna be? What they ended up doing was forming a corporation, right, that could take liability, that could accrue the funds, you know, and handle the money, and that's what happened. So now we have this Klamath River Renewal Corporation, which is crazy, but kind of cool too. I mean, right. it is this corporate model, right? It's like a corporation built those dams and a corporation's gonna take those <laughs> dams down. There's still one last major hurdle to clear the FERC still has to sign off on the agreement. And right now, 
four out of the five FERC commissioners are Trump appointees. Not the high-profile ones that show up in our news feeds, but still, it's enough to make me concerned that a sort of pro dem ideology could prevail again. I think it is a worry, but what we've heard or had telegraphed even out of the Trump administration, interestingly, is that they won't block it. So, if everything goes smoothly, then the dam should be coming out in 2021. You know, there's a lot of ways to remove a dam. One of them is to, like, clean everything up afterwards, right? Remove all the sediment and remove all the rebar and concrete. And another one is just to, like, kind of blast it, leave the rubble, and then that becomes, like, part of your stream structure, right? You know, we don't really understand how to restore a system. And a lot of times the best solution is the simplest solution. You know, when you put large woody debris in a stream, which we do deliberately to enhance fish habitat, you often don't fret too much about the placement of the log, which you used to do. You used to try to like fix it in permanently with rebar and yeah. And the stream is gonna blow it out in the high water anyway and put it where it wants to. And then it might blow it a mile or two downstream, and then you have these things, we call them catcher mitts, that catch other wood, which is good. You want that. But you might as well just let the stream decide, and it's probably a similar story with all the rubble from the dam, right? It's cheaper to do it that way. Is that is that what's going to happen? It looks very likely that's what's going to happen. Oh, so this is more the Rambo approach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to tear removal inside. <laughs> yeah. The Elwha was so controlled, I had to watch videos of it. I loved watching the videos of the Elwha. It was so, like, soothing. Like, ah, it can work. Look at that. No one has, in the history of the world has really done a dam removal this big. And they're still building them in D.C. and China much larger, right? So conceivably, someday we will be taking those out. But at this point, the Elwha is the biggest in the record books, and then the Klamath will be that much bigger still. And that's it for our two-part series on dams. We'll be back in a couple of weeks. If you live near a river, dammed up or otherwise, please take some time to get to know it. And make some stories together. If you'd like to see the photo that Anne took of Adam and I in our Driftwood recording studio, check out our Instagram at Future Ecologies. Please tell everyone you know. Subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever podcasts can be found. It really helps us get the word out. In this episode, you heard Anne Schaefer, Dave Parks, Ryan Hilperts, and Erica Terrence. This has been an independent production of Future Ecologies. Our first season is supported in part by the Vancouver Foundation. If you'd like to help us make the show, you can support us on Patreon. We have a whole series of mini-episodes available to our supporters. To get access to these, head over to patreon.com slash futureecologies. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and iNaturalist. The handle is always Future Ecologies. Special thanks to Jose Isordia, Kirsty Johnston Monroe Cameron, Nicole Yarus, Ilana Fenaryov, Skylar Lindbergh, Vincent Van Haff, and Andrzej Kozlowski. Music in this episode was produced by Radioactive Bishop, Kieran Fearing, and Sunfish Moonlight. You can find a full list of musical credits, show notes, and links on our website, futureecologies.net.